Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm so pleased and honored to be able to introduce to you Jeff Gallant, the Program Director for Affordable Learning Georgia, part of the University System of Georgia. Jeff and I have known each other for probably 10 years, ever since uh, we had our one of our affordable learning solutions events at the Chancellor's Office in Long Beach. And he and his uh, team came out uh, because we had been partners for several years and probably Jeff will talk a little bit about that. But um, uh, so it's been a delight to watch Jeff continue to grow expand and contribute to the open educational resources community through this program. And today we're very excited to hear more about what his topic is entitled, the co connections, collections, and calculations of the system-wide OER program for University System of Georgia. So um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time uh, preparing you all. I'm excited to have Jeff here and uh, thank you very much Jeff for being here with us today. All the way across the country it's it's lunchtime for you so <laughs> we'll be nice <laughs> but um, and it's very hot in Georgia as well so um, a lot of mercy for you at this point. Uh, but anyway without further ado um, we're excited to turn the baton over to you Jeff um, as our closing keynote speaker for our three-day Cal OER conference. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, yeah, it's it's been 10 years ever since we got our uh, Affordable Learning Georgia pilot team together. Uh, I was just a visiting program officer at that time, and I did want to give a special thank you uh, to the whole Cal State uh, team, uh, Leslie, uh, Jerry Hanley, the Merlot staff, um, they were the ones that really helped Affordable Learning Georgia get started. They were uh, one of the first bigger system-wide or consortial initiatives out there. And, you know, we like to say that we are one of those too, but CSU was doing it way before. And they gave us such a big springboard to get started. Uh, so much consulting advice over the years. Um, it's it's just always a joy to uh, to see Leslie and to see the whole team. I also want to thank uh, Delmar Larson and the Libre Tech staff. Uh, we've created quite a bit of OER, and we would love it to be as relevant and available as it possibly can be. And Delmar and the Libre Tech team will directly reach out to us uh, whenever they're trying to integrate anything and something's going wrong or we're missing something. Like they're they're the first ones. To, uh, to let me know. And we work together on making sure that, that all of our faculty created stuff is in LibreText as a result. And they're continuing to come up with really cool ideas like the ADAPT system. I, I just think it's great. Uh, so uh, thanks to that team too. And thanks to all of you for having me here as a keynote speaker. It's, it's really cool to uh, be virtually in California if, uh, you know, I can't necessarily enjoy that awesome weather. So today I'm really talking about the infrastructure it takes to have an OER program, a, a persistent one that's connected to uh, each institution that's, that it's a part of. And infrastructure, you know, I, I wanna be like Webster's Dictionary defines infrastructure as, but I do wanna take a look at it a little bit because when we talk about infrastructure in higher education, I think we kind of take for granted what we say it is. Uh, it, infrastructure in a lot of industries is a lot of physical resources and supply chain management and all of the structures, the buildings, the pipes. Um, when we're talking about any academic program, including open education. Infrastructure is a lot more human and a lot more intangible. And there are some big reasons for that that I'm gonna get into with a little bit of theory later on. And those things include people who are leading the way, um, structures of organization so that folks can contribute in really effective ways with each other, uh, the hardware and the software that it takes to keep OER programs going like a repository, um, a website, uh, the funding that it takes just for folks to spend time on this, let alone uh, 
getting the word out and having more people uh, do amazing things with OER. Uh, it takes a lot of training. We have our jargon and we have uh, some concepts that people are new to uh, when they encounter them. Sometimes they can be frightened by these new concepts and we have to be like the calming guiding force on these things uh, in order for the community to thrive at all. Uh, outreach too. And this isn't just for OER. If you're trying to get the ball rolling on service learning, or you're trying to get some faculty learning communities together on uh, things like uh, um, short teaching and uh, teaching better online courses. Like that stuff all has this infrastructure behind it. And it's more of a hidden and human infrastructure, but it's infrastructure nonetheless. Everything that OER infrastructure is about is it's the stuff that supports everyone doing that cool open education work. What you want to see and hear are faculty and librarians and instructional designers working together to reduce the cost of textbooks, to improve teaching and learning in their courses, uh, to share those results out with the world. You don't want to hear too much about what's going on behind the scenes, but that behind the scenes stuff is critical to keeping this going. So today I'm gonna to talk about three major categories of OER infrastructure uh, that exist in a big OER program. The first one is connections, uh, keeping the, uh, the community, the assemblage strong. I'll talk a little bit about assemblage theory, not too much today. Um, collections, so all the stuff when people create new open educational resources, what do you do with them? Uh, it isn't as simple as throwing it on the web, that's for sure. Um, and calculations, we have to be accountable. We also have to make sure that we know where we can improve uh, as a program. And therefore we have to get data and do a whole bunch of stuff to it. Uh, so these are just kind of three sectors of OER infrastructure, or you could say OER labor in another way, um, that are required to get a program like this going and to keep it going down the road. So the first one, and I think the most important one, the kind of fundamental one, is all about maintaining and creating new connections. So at the Open Education Conference in 2022, I had a talk about assemblages. If you heard that talk, go get yourself a snack, refill your water. This five minutes or so is a review. Um, some philosophers and sociologists out there who are looking at how societies function and how groups function, they, um, including the uh, writer of the book Assemblage Theory by Manuel de Landa, uh, they look at societies as groups of people, the materials that are around them, the buildings that are around them, uh, the agriculture that supplies them with food, the uh, water system, et cetera. It's all part of one big social whole. Um, the connections that exist between everything, between people, between a person and the way that they get to work, between the person and how they get a drink of water, those are all called interactions. Uh, they are kind of what connects the entire social whole together. And that's called an assemblage. Uh, assemblages exist outside of the individual parts of that assemblage. So there's always an external reason for why there's a group, why there's a city, something like that. And that external linkage between all this stuff, um, it's called exteriority. For example, if you look at Los Angeles, the way that people function, you know, if somebody's walking down the road, if somebody's waiting for the bus, if somebody's talking to someone else, they're not doing so because they were born Angelinos and they were born to walk down that street or wait at the bus or something like that. The external stuff is the location. They are in a certain place. They have uh, things to do. The society at large has needs that they all need to fulfill. And those externalities are why the assemblage is what it is. It's not because we are all just kind of 
born to be a part of something. So, you know, I'm not wearing a short sleeve shirt right now because I was born Mr. Short Sleeve Shirt. I, I'm in Georgia and it's really hot right now. So I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. Uh, you and I were all working towards getting an open education program together. We're, we're working towards furthering open education and by that furthering student success, uh, so long as we uh, continue this work. And it's not because we were born like putting an open license on our pacifiers. Uh, we, the, the higher education community has these needs and therefore we are working to, uh, to fill those needs. And externality is weird because that means that any assemblage that's there, it's contingent. Now, location is pretty solid, right? I mean, if you're in Los Angeles, you're in Los Angeles. If uh, let's say that uh, the world broke apart, all of a sudden, maybe then location's contingent. But something like the need for open education or the passion for open education that brings a community together, it is contingent because all of those little lines connecting the little parts together, those lines are interactions. And if those interactions cease, or if they just don't happen for a while, or they're infrequent, or when they happen, they're just really not that strong. And that's everything from an advocate reaching out to the community, uh, to an instructor taking a look at an OER and going, eh, um, that can break down the actual group, the actual open education program, and the community, the culture of open education too. Uh, so, so much of our work in open education because of this, because we are an assemblage and we are contingent on the interactions we have with our community and our resources and our materials. Um, because of that, persistence is key. We can't just set an open education program and forget it. There needs to be constant uh, work to, uh, you know, we, we think that we're just going to push the flywheel and then the engine's going to move if we've read uh, good to great. But in another way, we are constantly gardening. We are fostering um, connections between us and the open education community. We are fostering connections between advocates and other instructors who are new. Um, we're fostering connections through search engine optimization between the people we serve and the open educational resources that we want to get out there and that we want people to use. Um, all of that, all of these strengthening interactions and creating interactions is OER work. And so that's why this connection work is the most important thing about the job. If you're ever doing advocacy work and it's been 10 years and you're giving a presentation on the basics of OER again and you're going, well, why haven't we gotten beyond this point? Well, you're still strengthening and creating new interactions. That's why it's the most important thing about the job and that externality um, it, it, it can be on your shoulders. It can be one person. It could be a few key advocates who are doing it for nothing, but that's the most important part is keeping these connections. And yeah, everything uh, is an assemblage according to Delanda and according to my take on open education too. I mean, the program leaders in an o OER program do quite a bit centrally but then it's the advocates who really get the word out. They're the ones who do a lot of the crucial work of creating connections between your program and an individual instructor. Uh, the participants, the grantees, they can become uh, champions and advocates over time. And then you've got the kind of more external world of all faculty and staff that are hopefully all working towards student success the same way that you are, and you would hope that you could bring them in. So that's why connections tend to be everything in this job and why you have to keep up interactions and keep persisting on them. So what do we do? 
Well, the first thing that we established in ALG were our champions. And I keep saying you should be finding your champions whenever you start a program. If there are outstanding projects on your campus uh, where someone has created an OER or even just replaced materials with an OpenStax textbook, um, you should be reaching out, uh, maybe even to the groups that uh, are furthering pedagogy as well. Um, the science of teaching and learning folks, uh, the ones who are jumping into critical pedagogy, uh, who will talk about Paulo Freire at the drop of a hat, those folks are ones that you should be having connections with um, regarding OER. You can also uh, award past efforts, you can recognize them, uh, you can grow a connected group over time. Uh, so let's say that you've done these first three or so things, you're starting to find out who your champions are and who has a little bit of time to uh, put into this, a little energy to as well. So now you have this group of champions, then you should start regular interactions because you're going to be strengthening your connections in your program with the advocates who are going to be connecting outward to. Uh, a periodic meeting helps with this. So it's, it's easy for me to say, well, we have our champions meeting every month, but the theoretical underpinnings as to why we have this infrastructure, why we make these connections over and over and over again, uh, has to do with the, the uh, contingency and the exteriority of open education. Um, so let's say that you have gotten that periodic meeting together. What do you do then? Um, if you have absolutely nothing to discuss, if you don't have like a new uh, grant program that has to get out there and therefore you're just going full steam ahead, you can start forming. Um, you know, what is it that this group's gonna be about? You can brainstorm together uh, about the needs of your institution, about how open can help with those needs. Uh, and then over time, create a strategy together. Um, our pilot team, when we were working with the Cal State system, we came up with a logic model first. How do you get to OER exist and student success? What are the steps in between that you get to that point with? What's the, what's the basic pitch? And past that point, what do we need to get anything like this started? Uh, so yeah, there are plenty of like interesting founding documents. And you might take a look at those and go, well, this isn't on the grounds work. This should all be grassroots. Why are we doing all of the central planning? It, it's totally crucial for this kind of reason. You should be setting this foundation uh, for generating more and more interactions regarding OER. Uh, and setting priorities is another thing too. You don't want to go after creating a new OER in a field if your big problem right now is that you have mostly introductory courses with uh, students who are saying that the textbook costs are way too high. Maybe you address the affordability in uh, these introductory courses first, and then down the line, you look towards more original works. Um, or maybe you've got a very highly specialized campus that uh, prioritizes service to the community. Maybe OER creation is your thing at the start uh, as, as a result. But yeah, you've now gathered these champions together. You are regularly interacting with them. They're the most important aspect of this program immediately. You're going to be running every change by them uh, that affects the, the program as a whole. Anything that affects uh, institutions really does go through our champions at ALG. Uh, so I want to see a little bit in the chat. Are you an OER champion? Uh, I am guessing plenty of you are. First of all, you're awesome. Uh, second of all, how did you or how are you or how do you expand OER use or knowledge on your campus? So just type it into the chat. Even if it's, I don't do too much, but I use OER, that's fine. I just want to hear from you. Converted all courses to OER at four campuses. Excellent. Oh, a roving adjunct. Well, that's cool. You're like sowing seeds at each place, uh, setting examples. That's neat. 
Um, the OER liaison for the college after using it for a few years. That's so cool. Um, Champion makes me think that I've won, but I've not won. I'm trying to. I, I think of Champion as more like a paragon, a representative, uh, not not necessarily a winner of a. But yeah, I I do get that connotation though. Use OER in classes, and when I was a grad student, I helped to create a text. Oh, that's cool trying OER in all classes this semester, I'm running a faculty incentive initiative, excellent. Uh, connections is exactly how the OERI has approached its statewide work. Aha, uh -huh. establishing a web of connections, right. Perfect. Uh, Nicole's trying to get others to transition their classes. Alejandro co-wrote to OER and use OER for three courses. Wow. Uh, yes, it went from being a faculty member using OER to being the lead on a grant initiative. Uh, still new on campus, trying to recognize the faculty work that predates me. Yeah. Uh, presented a, a LibreTex training to my department. Oh, cool. Uh, creating LibGuides, being a liaison, being part of an OER task force, uh, course coordinator, converting 24 sections of non-major biology to OER materials. Wow. Okay, one person is feeling a little shut down in San Bernardino. Uh, our well-intentioned board member is a great advocate for students wants books plus for the whole system, which would be great for publishers, uh, but not for OER. Yeah, that is a tough one. Our champions um, have been really good at finding out when these conversations are taking place where things like uh, a forced course fee might be uh, in discussions and then um, being part of those discussions as much as possible, but it's tough. If you're not part of those discussions and you're not let in, it's it's really tough to be in at that point. Upgrading OER ancillaries, perfect. An Aussie librarian, ah, helping course coordinators move away from commercial textbooks towards OER adoption and creation. Oh, thanks Jennifer from Libre Text. Tell everyone I meet about it. Oh, wow, very cool. Y'all do so much. I could, I could read these forever, um, but that might be more like a Twitch stream and, and less like a presentation. So I will keep going, but I think that this is really neat. Y'all do amazing stuff. And so, yeah, our champion strategy started uh, back in 2013. And there were some problems that we were dealing with that led to this. We don't have a listserv that contacts everybody at the university system office. Uh, I can't just go USG faculty and be like, we have grants, like come apply. Uh, that isn't in existence. There's no uniform way to contact faculty. And also when I'm trying to send out emails to uh, folks, Often USG emails tend to get ignored automatically in inboxes because there are just so many initiatives. It, it is kind of the email equivalent of initiative fatigue and we can't mandate things. We're not going to say you must do this and then suddenly everybody does it. Um, we are just supportive. And because we are just supportive, we have to reach out to folks and let them know that that support exists and we can't do that alone. Um, and also, if we just create support systems on our own and think, well, you know what would be good, and we just do it, um, our institutions might be completely out of it because something that uh, is in their policy, something that is in their priorities, their mission, their culture, uh, doesn't line up with what we're doing. So we need to make sure we involve everyone. So we gathered library champions and faculty champions in 2013. Um, there are even more now. And they had OER teaching experience on the faculty side, finding, hosting, organizing on the library side. Uh, and they were really either experienced with open, even in an open access to research way or an open education way uh, to get us started. And often they, they knew even more about open pedagogy than we did back then. And we needed to find these champions too. Not, uh, we didn't know everybody was going to be an OER champion right from the outset. We didn't just say, oh, okay, I know all these people. Uh, we had to send out formal letters to the provost so that they could get uh, going on searching for a faculty director, which was cool for a couple of reasons. First, the job got done. But second, the provost then knew that Affordable Learning Georgia was a thing and that it was taking place and that there was going to be somebody on that campus who you, they could reach out to 
when they wanted to deal with anything that had to do with affordability, the cost of textbooks, educational equity, um, suddenly there was a contact there. Uh, we also did some awards for previous achievements. We did those at a teaching and learning conference, uh, of course, recognizing the folks who are pushing the needle on pedagogy, um, formalizing that meeting process, making sure that our champions met every first Thursday of the month once we got them. And then we would have institution specific meetings down the line. Uh, so we have a big group. Uh, sometimes there are 50 to 60 people in one of our champions meetings. And when we ask, how are you doing? What's going on on campus? You might have a lot to say, but you look at that group and you go, well, I don't want to waste everybody's time. And so having smaller meetings where we can interact more one on one with those folks uh, to find out what's going on at their institution. What's what's critical to the very unique parts of that assemblage, right? Um, that was really important to us. So we were doing that. Uh, then we lost a program manager. We have a new program manager. We're going to start doing that again. Um, our design champions too. We added instructional designers to the mix. Uh, some of the most critical folks to the OER process. Uh, it's really nice that, that um, we have instructional designers as part of this initiative now in a, in a more formal way. And yeah, and there's also relationships uh, going on through our grant program. And this is more about the connections that happen with resources and the connections that happen with uh, support structures that are in place. Still infrastructure, still interactions, um, but it's not the social connections that we're talking about with our champions. So if you think about how long it takes to create a new course, and someone says, okay, well, our department's going to create a new course. Quite a while, right? Even if you're revising an old course, if you're someone who focuses on student success, wants to make sure that everything's current, that you're really meeting student learning outcomes, that you look at uh, your grades data and you go, okay, so where did stuff go a little bit wrong in this course? Like if you're pouring over that and then doing all the revisions on it and then getting those revisions approved and having plenty of meetings uh, that have to do with consensus, that's a long time. If you then had to also curate, create and revise the materials, that's even longer. And because I because of our question in chat, I know that some of you already do this and you know how long this takes. So a grant or a course release program can help. It can give the experts, the faculty, the librarians who can help find stuff, the staff, uh, the instructional designers who can help um, with all of the design principles, making stuff accessible, getting stuff online. All of that time it, is critical, right? And so a grant or a course release program can help you do wonderful things with OER because it grants you that time. So this is not, we paid people to use free stuff. Ha ha. No, this is not a bribe. <laughs> this is absolutely intense work. And for those of you who are doing that work, which I kind of think is all of you, you probably know this already. But organizationally and programmatically, this is needed. It is not something where you're just paying people to move over to the open side. You really are paying people to do good things. Um, so you have to encourage a lot of planning on the front end in order for this to work. Um, otherwise, you're going to wind up with project teams in a grant process that have to start planning after they already get the grant and they go, oh, what do we do now? So having a a competitive rounds, a reviewed rounds where the quality of the planning is part of the process. That's, I think, a, a really big part of it. That's something that we've done, I think, especially well in, uh, in Georgia. We have a peer review process, then we have an administrative review process. Um, when folks do not get their award, like uh, when, when a, an application is not accepted for an award, we try as hard as possible to make it very clear that they are not being rejected from this program, that there are ways to uh, plan even more, there are ways to fix this, uh, there are ways to increase the impact of your program um, that can uh, have you come back in another round with a better plan. And some of our amazing projects, well, we would run 
uh, featured speaker program where our grantees would present on like the cool stuff they did. And I'd be surprised sometimes because I would forget through this huge process, we now have, uh, I believe, we're, we're approaching 700 transformation grant applications, 200 mini grant applications. Um, we are about to start a new type of grant too. So we're getting all, uh, up to about a thousand applications. Every so often, one of the most successful teams will say, we got rejected twice. And I'm like, oh no. But you know, it, it was the work that they did on the planning end of things that led to the cool stuff happening once they got the award. So in a way, it is that kind of both selectivity and creative feedback uh, at the same time. Yeah, you can take that grant proposal, apply for another grant with that same proposal. Right. Um, we, we tend to say uh, in, in our program, uh, here's, here's what you need to work on for the next time, for sure. Oh, account for chaos is like the amount of times I say account for chaos is like the amount of times I say the it's it's a lot. Uh, but yes, please do account for chaos whenever you design these programs. Um, if they are too strict, if you're demanding so much and they absolutely have to get it done on this particular deadline and it has to go exactly how they planned, there's going to be a lot of stuff that will go terribly wrong. Uh, family emergencies are going to happen. Medical emergencies will happen. Turnover, global pandemics have happened. Uh, we have witnessed multiple uh, sudden and unexpected deaths in our grant teams. And we've had to uh, figure out the ethical business practices for funding in, in those cases. Uh, be flexible because uh, this pr this kind of work will demand you to be flexible. So I do want to uh, throw it over to the chat a little bit more. Have you ever worked on a grant or a course release project or a stipend project uh, for OER? And think about who helped you there uh, throughout the process. Who was it and how did they do it? Okay, uh, yes, you have, and it was my team members who helped it through, through it all. Tax my patience quite a bit. Yeah, uh, if you ever apply for a grant, I would highly suggest, if you have the option to, uh, to team up. And if it's not just uh, faculty within your department, bring a librarian in, uh, bring an instructional designer in. They're amazing folks. Uh, Laura went through an intensive three-week, 30-hour grant-funded training program helps with the OER ZTC lead on campus. She built the program, helped to create OER and convert all the classes. That's so cool. Uh, supported a group applying for an OER grant. Excellent, our campus grants office was very helpful. It's great when campus grants offices are very helpful. And I bet as I say that, some of you are chuckling because it, it, it's not the same at every campus. Um, here we have uh, a few institutions where our grants offices are so engaged that they've joined the champions meetings, uh, especially over at Georgia Gwinnett College. Those people love OER to the point where they are the ones that reach out about our grants and they, uh, they help people in making a great grant proposal. Uh, Nicole created a grant, yeah. Uh, small statement to produce a canvas shell. Excellent. LibreText acted as support. Very cool. LibreText Libre team was helpful. Yeah. Lots of shout outs to LibreText here. Excellent. Oh, Ryan is leading the ZTC grant process at West Los Angeles College. Nice. Off campus colleagues helped. Uh, the ASCCC helped. The OERI team helped. A lot of support from Delmar and his team. Thank you from Taft College in California. Uh, collaborating on a new grant with the local CSU uh, starting this month. <laughs> wow. Uh, the faculty from CSU Bakersfield have been wonderful. The Kaleidoscope Project in 2013. Oh my goodness. That takes me back. Oh, supported by the Director of Distance Ed. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> so many shout outs to LibreTex. Shout out to the pets that help us through OER grants and projects. Emotional support. Yes. Thank you, Kelsey. Of course. Ah, and, and thank you too, Jennifer. Excellent. <laughs> Tomar says, go Rocket. Yep. <laughs> Rocket is my dog. You, you might have seen uh, a picture of Rocket in the lobby. Uh, I'm in the office today, so I can't just point the camera at Rocket. Uh, Alejandro says, does anyone get a course release for OER creation? It depends. Uh, over here, we have uh, transformation grants that have a uh, maximum of $5,000 per teammate. And we hope that institutions can work with uh, faculty to make that a course release or summer pay or overload. Um, some institutions do that very well. Others do, uh, well, others for different reasons do not. So for example, if you are paid quite a bit and we um, have this amount of money for a course release and they look at your percentage of salary and they say, well, that's not enough. Okay, yeah. Oh, my dog is in my OER's acknowledgement page. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> very cool. All right. So um, an alternative to this, if you don't have grant program funding, you can provide dedicated support time as well. I remember uh, when Ohio State, when, when the Ohio State University <laughs> got started, uh, they didn't really have a lot of grant funds, but they had amazing instructional designers. So the instructional design office offered uh, basically a, a personal consultant on OER for a certain amount of time. And that was in order to create new OER. Uh, so they really did take a creation lens. And yeah, librarians can help find things for faculty. That is a, a really tough part of the process, not just finding the OER that exists, but determining when you've searched enough and there aren't OER that exists and you are now the one that has to write it. It's a lot like the research process. You have to do a literature review of everything that's out there to find out whether or not you're even doing original work or relevant work. It's the same kind of thing here. Librarians are super helpful. And yeah, you could also have instructional designers help out with technology, help out with accessibility. Um, the thing is when you have a program like this, you really have to dedicate that time. That's why I'm not just saying support time, I'm saying dedicated support time. If uh, you're saying that this librarian, as part of the other duties as a science, part of the job description, along with being a reference librarian and an e-resources librarian and a virtual services librarian, um, is also going to be the point of contact for OER and copyright and everything else, um, that's going to be really tough for them. It may uh, completely break down how uh, your program works. Um, Ash says, yeah, in many higher ed institutions in Australia, the librarians also help with the copyright aspect. Yep, same here in the US too. Oh, yep, Nicole said, you just mentioned part of my job. You're gonna do all this and then OER, yay. Uh, yeah, try as hard as possible to get OER work into your job description and have it be something that is considered as part of your time. Uh, you're, you know, you have a certain amount of hours you, you can work. And if you're going to be effective at this, you need dedicated time to help folks out with OER. All right. Um, and of course, the, the challenge and the cool thing and the thing that should happen is to have a position dedicated to OER entirely. Um, once you have enough of a priority at your institution that OER work is in demand and it's it's a lot, you should have an OER librarian or an, at the very least an OER instructional designer. One of those uh, was at the University of Georgia for a long time. The biggest study on Pell eligible uh, grantees and uh, the effect of OER on race and the effect of OER on part-time versus full-time, that article came out of a department that had an OER dedicated staff. I mean, not a whole bunch of them, but it had at least a part of their time dedicated to OER. There was an OER coordinator funded by the Gates Foundation before that really helped in uh, setting that tone. 
And that time support, of course, will lead to more champions or even different kinds of champions, uh, maybe informal champions that talk about their work and how it went. Um, or let's say that a faculty champion uh, moves, they go somewhere else. Now you've got all these past grantees who have done amazing stuff. They probably would love to help out too. Um, oh, Michaela says, I am a tenure track OER librarian at CSU Fullerton. Glad my university had that kind of forethought. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That's exactly uh, what, what should be happening here. Um, so yeah, you've got these set, a new set of connections with grantees. And like I said, th this is part of an assemblage and it is contingent on interactions. If you have past grantees and they just kind of fade away, then you've got just about what every higher education teaching initiative does, which is you put them through a training program, they do a thing, they send a report, wasn't that cool, on to the next thing. You want to keep the OER program grounded. You want to keep reaching out to folks. At least send them the notifications about new grants. That's an easier thing to do. You've already got their contact information. Send out any new opportunities that you can see for research projects or sustainability projects. Um, so let's, uh, for example, over on our side, we've got mini grants. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But there are national research opportunities out there. There's the Open Education Group Fellowship. Uh, getting those out to grantees, those calls for proposals, for applications can really help. Um, I told you about the featured speaker thing. I won't keep going. Uh, the SGA, your Student Government Association, uh, can sometimes create uh, more of a buzz than anyone at your central system office might be able to do. Uh, some SGAs have done award programs to recognize folks who teach with OER, and I think that that's really cool. Um, yeah, uh, nominating teams for international awards. If somebody's done something amazing, the OE Global OER Awards are a great way to get the word out about that amazing project. Uh, over here, we had uh, an OE Global Award for adaptation at Kennesaw State University for technical, uh, a technical writing OER. Uh, past grantee information gathering. So if you want to know more about your program, reach back out to those grantees. Participating in Open Education Week. Yes, for sure. Uh, Delmar, thank you. Um, and yeah, keep them in the loop in case you need a new champion, for sure. So we had a transformation grant at first, which was replace the materials in your class with OER. That is a transformation of the course. Uh, it was a big maximum amount for your time. And then uh, folks were reaching back out and saying, well, you know, we have these materials and that's great, but we'd love to create a set of ancillaries. We'd love a video set that would invite more students into these materials, uh, new ways of engaging folks, especially if they're online. And we couldn't do that through the transformation grants. You can't transform your course twice. You can, but you can't in this program. Uh, so we wound up with many grants that we started calling continuous improvement grants. These are ways to create new ancillaries, uh, create a new revision, update an OER to uh, make it more current for you know 2023. And these are all about sustaining OER use over time. Um, but usually because they are all about revisions, you wind up with cool deliverables that you could share out with the rest of the world. A lot of our ancillary materials and our textbooks come from uh, these continuous improvement grants. We have a kickoff meeting to connect with all of our grantees. We have asynchronous training uh, that also is a, a resource that connects with grantees. Uh, Delmar says curation and sustaining is often poorly addressed in the field, and this is great to address. Yeah, curation especially is, is a tough one. Um, and then uh, we are adding research grants. Uh, so this year we are in our request for proposals, including a research grants um, category where folks are going to address at least one aspect of the KU framework, cost, outcomes, usage, and perception uh, that the Open Education Group put together. Uh, stuff like what we've seen emerge out of this program as research, but on sometimes a grander scale, um, sometimes exploring a new, uh, a new subject or 
uh, something that may be even more original than that, that we haven't even considered. Um, and grantees often do become champions in our program and vice versa. Champions um, being the points of contact for all of this OER and being volunteers, we're not paying them and then double paying them as grantees or something like that. They are volunteers and it's amazing that they do it. It's, it's really cool. Um, they will often become paid grantees to help out folks with this stuff. Uh, Georgia Southern, we've got a few champions that are embedded in just about every project. And it's cool because they all do amazingly successful work because they've got like that point of contact where if you want to curate resources, they've got the LibGuides person. They know exactly how to do that. Uh, if you want to design new resources, you've got the instructional design person. They can help you do that. And what's next in uh, our Champions program, we are working on with our new program manager. Uh, so I would have more to add here in you know, December, but not right now. And of course, outreach is super important. Uh, we could also call this marketing. We could also call this advertising. Uh, you need to raise awareness of these opportunities. And every bit of outreach is an interaction. Uh, training, the same exact thing, uh, not just making people aware, but easing their tension about not knowing Creative Commons licenses or um, you know, easing the, the points of fear about things like copyright. Uh, training does more than just create capable people. It creates confident people. Accessibility training is so important. If you're going to create anything and share it out with the world, it should be accessible to as many people as possible. And so um, our accessibility training tends to be focused on faculty and not just compliance with the law. Uh, just, you know, here are the skills that you need in order to make stuff accessible. And yeah, if you're looking for an OER coordinator or a librarian, that's why you have to keep a lookout for engagement. Um, that's a huge part of this. Uh, you know, when we have uh, interviews for our OER program manager, we had a, a simulated presentation. And a lot of times people are like, ah, oh, presentation is the middle of an interview, that's too much. But for us, it was one of the most important parts because you can have all the capabilities in the world, but if you're not connecting with your audience, then you're not creating strong interactions. So that was one of the big things uh, that we focused on for our hiring process too. Now I'm gonna talk about the other things that happen here, uh, collections of things. I'm gonna go a little faster here. I really wanted to lean on connections. In fact, everything I'm talking about past this point are in essence connections too, but they are specific things that have to do with the OER work that goes on in the background. So if you have uh, grants, uh, if you have any kind of course release program, a stipend program, you're probably gonna get reports back. And this is the baseline for the collections you want to share out with the world. How did these teams do? Here you go, here's a report. They should at least prov uh, provide a blueprint of sorts. Um, you know, we did this in our course. Uh, we used a certain uh, amount of resources. Here are the resources. Here are the subjects that we uh, taught throughout the semester. Oh, Ash says, I think there's a level of digital literacy training needed too that is often overlooked. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and of course, if you um, have reviews of OER, that's even better because then when you share those out with the world, that involves others in the evaluation process. You've done it in California for years. Cool for Ed uh, was really nice. A blueprint must include rubrics and tips for accessibility. Yeah, if you're talking about uh, grant programs and stuff like that, tips for accessibility, exactly. Um, a faculty blueprint where it's like, hey, here's what we used. Sometimes I, I think there should be more talk of accessibility on those, but yes. Um, and you can even provide adoption information sometimes um, alongside your resources. At LSU, uh, library resources were connected with the exact courses uh, that they use. So now you have a point of contact. Now you have a reference point to um, what OER were being used for what course. But it's going to be inevitable if you run an OER program that you're not only going to have teams that use things that exist on uh, the web 
and they're going to leave them as is and nothing's going to change. You're gonna to have to share something out. Um, most likely they will have created lecture slides. Sharing those out is super important because ancillary materials are in high demand. Uh, worksheets the same way, especially if you've got uh, STEM field uh, worksheets, things like worked problems, and uh, those are super important. Uh, case studies, assignments, projects, um, especially if you've got assignments that are not the disposable variety, the ones where you can even share out uh, students who have consented to make their work open, you can share out their perspectives and their learning materials. Uh, so this can get complicated. You're even sharing videos and podcasts and simulations. I've had uh, some reports with materials that came in and the materials were about five gigabytes in size. That's very hard to share. <laughs> so be aware that sizes can get very large for these things and streaming media may be a good alternative. Um, if you're gonna host it, even if someone else made it, is that thing accessible too? So you can kind of point and say, well, they have to fix it. But sometimes you're gonna get something and you're just gonna to have to make it accessible yourself. And you'll have to make that decision um, whether or not you push back to the team and say, no, this must be in this format. Or if you can go, okay, well, I can create a, a heading structure here. I can make this structured text. I can't describe 200 chemistry diagrams in alt text, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, some of the accessibility things you might be doing on your end, too. And, yeah, when you wind up hosting all of this stuff, you can't just throw it on a website. Uh, so how easy is it to find OER in 2023? Uh, just uh, your, your quick thoughts on this through chat. And if there's anything that could possibly help. OER audiobooks. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so Laura says OER has grown exponentially. Uh, that's both good and bad. If you run a search, you will probably find OER, but there's a lot of it out there. Nicole says, yeah, finding it's fairly easy, but managing expectations is harder. If they can't find something perfect in five minutes, yeah, exactly. And, and that's that kind of interaction thing, right? If that's the interaction with a resource, you can find discouragement because of it. Uh, LibreText being a big help. Shout outs there. MIT Courseware, interesting. Uh, help OER, uh, dedicated search engine. Yep, special tags. I was constantly reinventing the OER repository. So there are 8 million of them to cross check. Yep. <laughs> Centralizing and clear labeling would help. Absolutely. Curating collections by discipline, by gen ed requirements, by uh, associate degrees for transfer. Oh, wow. And see, there's so many different ways to organize these things. And, and it's emerging right now that this is exactly it. Uh, Aussies chat about the need for a central referatory. Yeah, also better referatories in general. Yep. Uh, compared to the last time I looked at it, uh, it has been, as Delmar said, drinking water from a fire hose. <laughs> Yeah, uh, humanities copyright can be an issue. Yep, exactly. So at the, at the bare minimum, when you receive these inevitable OER that you're gonna have to share, you're going to need a repository for it. And the reason why is because you can't just have an alphabetical list of file names on a website. This isn't 1992. Um, you, don't, uh, you won't know where they're made. You won't know who made them. You won't know what course they're for. Um, you won't know the open licensing on them. And so you need a place to do that. And repositories are especially about the data about the data you're sharing, metadata. Uh, so you're hosting it. So big files, file sizes are uh, 
an important thing. Download speeds are an important thing. The way that uh, servers stay up is an important thing, but also the metadata is how you make it discoverable. Um, if you categorize things by title, you're gonna have to have title metadata. Uh, your institution, your course number, the description of it, the open license, the subject area. And what is the subject area? Are we just going to say biology? Are we going to say microbiology? Are we going to say microbiology for allied health? That you can dig down quite a bit uh, to get to that point. There's a lot of thought and a lot of time that goes into this work. And once again, it cannot be other duties as assigned. So we started with an adoption focused program. We made this mistake in 2014. We said, transformation grants, find OER, put it into your course, voila. And people made OER immediately. And we went, oh boy, how do we host this? So we had to put them on a table on our website because we had nowhere else to go. So two years later, yeah, we made a B Press repository when we were uh, receiving regular funding, uh, created a metadata schema along with them from scratch. Uh, that would have been very hard to do if we were hosting it on our servers ourselves back in 2016. Uh, three years later, we went beyond static files uh, to a manifold instance that creates more responsive and accessible web versions. You also have responsive and accessible web versions of things through LibreText now too. Um, and yeah, we wanted to make sure that accessibility training uh, focused on faculty skills. We, want, we created those resources in our repository uh, for that. And also we started teaching folks how to interact with manifold in accessibility training. Um, and now we have so many resources that I've had to create an, basically an app in Excel to grab all the metadata for a much larger table and present it in the way that we're going to enter things in manifold and BPress. If it was just me, I could do this ragged method of uh, just putting things in. But as soon as I bring somebody new in, I go, this is inhumane for somebody else to do this. So I had to make it a lot more readable. And that goes into calculations and your knowledge of things like Excel. Um, so your data is at the very least going to be the direct way of staying accountable. Um, when you have a grant program, you know that those things have happened. If you got a report that says it didn't happen, then it didn't happen and you're not tracking that anymore. Uh, so make sure that you're designing grant applications and your grant reports at the end to make data collection easy. That does mean online forms sometimes. That even means sometimes uh, redundant answering on the part of the project lead. You know, you're putting your uh, your student success numbers over here and you're putting them over here, but it's going to help so much in the long run to have that data available. So when you're creating grant programs, have a mind for, for data going. And you wanna analyze the data through two different ways. One is accountability. Um, if your program is set up to save students money on textbook costs, are you? Here is the data that we have. It's also, uh, about making sure that your living organism that is a, an OER program has the data it needs to adapt and improve uh, to, to its environment, to what's around it, to the assemblage. Uh, has anyone had trouble with a program in a way that can be improved? Try to find a way to do that. And uh, course markings are also a part of this. They are a huge part of it in California. They can be really authoritative. Uh, they also can be unreliable. It depends on how they're reported. So we have one system over here uh, in the USG, one banner system. You would think it'd be really easy to do, but because that system is dependent on institutions setting up a workflow for faculty to add the thing to it that says it's no it's a no cost resources course or a low cost resources course it winds up being all over the place some institutions we can trust the data others were like well they didn't do it this time around so it's zero um it can be really tough so we have a lot of grain of salt notifications on things like that there's an entire textbook for course marking i could talk about it for five hours we don't have five hours. So uh, there is um, one out there. It is uh, a Rebus community text, I believe. Um, yeah. 
I love to hear that one uh, inform yeah one SIS is student information system is not the answer to everything that's for sure. Oh wow, Natalie's got a lot of interesting stuff on. Oh yep, ca uh, capturing students' anecdotal data, uh, quality uh, answering the question that I wasn't quite uh, getting at as much as I should. Keep qualitative data in mind. Just because you have the numbers doesn't mean you can illustrate what those numbers really mean to students. And what, um, you know, what Natalie's talking about here is exactly that. What would you have rather done with that money uh, that you spent on textbooks? Part of the hashtag textbook broke campaign going back uh, quite a ways, that was part of all of this. So once you've got all that data, uh, how are you going to report it? How are you going to keep it up on a website in such a way that enough people can mess around with it, but it's still simple enough to understand? Uh, visualization. So, you know, what's the platform you're going to use to visualize these things? How do you make it clear? How do you make it engaging? If you have too many spreadsheets, you may do a SQL database. Um, you might uh, instead just bring it up to things like. Uh, Oh, I, I have a request uh, to put the course markings textbook in the chat. I will do that at the end for sure. And yeah, uh, options on database hosting can be very expensive. So a uh, grain of salt on that as well. So we started with yearly estimates uh, over here and we immediately went, oh no, that's a problem when we had a second year of funding and people want us to know how much we've actually saved as opposed to prospective savings. So we uh, reformed our data strategy immediately. I am no data scientist, but I got thrown into this in kind of a nightmare scenario. And so uh, the good thing about it though, was that I had folks who were helpful and they eased my tension in knowing data in the same way that I ease people's tension in getting to know open. And because of that, yep, that is exactly it, Ash. Thanks so much. That is marking open and affordable courses. Right, it was UT Arlington's press books. Got it, thank you so much. Um, yep, and so yeah, uh, also because now we're having these grants over and over again, that data is only as good as it is accurate and faculty will do different things down the line. So we check in after each year to see if use is sustained or discontinued. If it's discontinued or they don't respond, it's zero because we're very conservative about that. Um, Ryan says, does anyone know if you can export a dashboard in Tableau and import it into Power BI? If you can export a dashboard in Tableau by its data um, into a CSV or an Excel file, then you can put it into Power BI. I don't know if there's a Tableau app for it in Power BI. That is a possibility. Um, if you have it in any, uh, I would say, semi-common format uh, for data, then you should be able to get it into Power BI by converting it first, exporting it as a, a commonly used file. If you can use something in that you're drawing from in Tableau in Excel, you should be able to get that into Power BI that way. I hope that makes sense, sorry. Um, yeah, and our course markings, of course, uh, are, arrived in 2018. They are still inconsistent. Our reports uh, include things about, uh, here's, here's what we thought happened at the institution, uh, how can we help? Um, and yeah, we're looking at database options. So all of this work is how we can say uh, that since 2014, uh, when we were first funded, uh, our affordability programs have saved students more than 143 million. That is through faculty doing amazing things uh, with OER and with other affordable resources like library resources. Our grants, that was 119 million. Our partnership with ECOR where they went zero textbook costs, uh, that's uh, 24.8 million over that time. And you can see the other numbers on this page. Uh, we can say this with confidence because this is a conservative estimate. Anyone who didn't get back to us within a year saying, we're still using these, that those savings are off the map. Uh, and all of our institutions have participated with more than 600 funded projects at this point. Um, so I was going to ask this question, but instead what I'm going to do is open it up uh, for questions at the end. So the last thing I'm going to say here is that this is a lot of work. I have already said that this is a lot of work. I'm going to keep saying that this is a lot of work. You need someone or someone's 
who are proficient in everything that I just said and more, including high stakes conversations with administrators about prioritizing an OER program, vendors in uh, contracts for things like repositories or affordable materials, uh, contract management, if you have grants, MOU management, strategic planning, uh, we have our own strategic plan here at ALG, uh, the pandemic happens in the middle of it, so we are making a new one, uh, financial management, stewardship of funds, we have a budget, we have to manage it every year, uh, technical knowledge, you got to know at least HTML if you're going to deal with a program that ingests uh, OER and creates something web readable. Uh, Markdown also helps. Accessibility uh, work really helps. Universal design for learning work helps a lot. Um, and being a supervisor with empathy. Uh, even if you're just supervising grant teams, you need to be the, the calm one that helps folks get something awesome done. Um, you know, when you're working with them, when you're working with direct reports too, chaos happens, uh, the pandemic happened. Um, being able to understand where people are coming from and work with them where they are and, and make sure that you're giving enough space and enough support that they can do their best. Like that's, that's part of it, uh, part of empathizing with folks for sure. Okay, uh, so I'm going to open up this uh, for questions. Here's my contact information. I am not on what was what used to be called Twitter. That's for sure. 